Hello everyone, good morning and thanks for attending this um, first session that I've run as part of Leeds Digital Festival. I'm just going to put the presentation on, just bear me one second. So you should be able to see the presentation, taking audiences to remote locations, why immersive 360 film production. This is part of Leeds Digital Festival 2020. Um, today we're going to look at, um, well, I want to try and give you something that you can actually take away. So um, I want to give you some tools to be able to make your own immersive media. Um, so the objective today really is learn how to produce a virtual reality experience and to plan, shoot and edit your own 360 film. Um, we're going to look at the methodology of immersive quality and new technology. Um, we're going to touch on what is embodiment and telepresence. Uh, we're going to look at the audio visual tools that you can use to create immersive experiences and we're going to look at a snapshot of the workflows um, we're going to touch on changing industries and we're going to look at the future and where the technology is going and then uh, time permitting we'll have a little q a session at the end so that's um, the overview of today uh, i want to give you as participants, um, some tools to take away from this experience because there's a, obviously a lot of webinars now. We're doing all these virtual events, so the idea here is to you can actually physically take something away and make your own experiences. So a little bit about me, uh, my background: I'm a trained filmmaker and VR developer. So predominantly, I've been in 360 film design and production for a number of years now. I kind of mastered that um, and then I went into the VR developer um, sphere, if you like, and started becoming a, a developer. So I use a lot of games engine technology for my practice and what I do. Um, I make a lot of training simulators and this kind of stuff. So I use 360 film in a, in a way that allows the, the viewer of that experience to actually um, learn something in a, in a training environment. Um, I do a little bit of augmented reality production as well. And that's what I've been doing now for about five years. And then last year, I founded a company called AV Merce, and just because I wanted to try and step out of my comfort zone and push myself and see what I could do um, a little bit differently. So the, the sectors that I've worked in, really, I've worked, worked in quite a broad sphere of um, different sectors. I've worked in healthcare and heritage, environment, education, fashion and arts. So that's where I'm, I'm kind of like doing most of my work at the moment. I just want to check if one can hear me actually, just because I've not actually gone back to the chat and just to see if everyone can actually hear me okay. Um, yeah, loud and clear, brilliant, just want to make sure. It's really weird because when I go into webinar mode, it kind of kills the, the chat function on the right. So I just wanted to check that, brilliant. Thank you everyone. Just go back into the presentation and then if i go to share screen again brilliant back in okay okay so looking at the methodology and immersive quality of new technology um it's quite a um, broad set of terms there what what do we actually mean by that um what do we mean by immersive that's quite an important term important term so you might hear that term banded about quite quite a lot at the moment, um, as well as the term virtual, because we've been in this pandemic situation for a while now. Um, we, we're having these sort of virtual events um, taking place all the time like this um, sort of thing. Um, but immersive can refer to technology that attempts to emulate a physical world. So it's kind of like um, you, you can be um, immersed um, inside a, a digital world or you can use 360 photography or film to actually um, give a, a sensation of um, interaction with, with a digital world um, that's simulated um, and it gives some um, sort of sensory feedback. So that's what we mean when we mean immersive. I'm sure there are a number of definitions for the word immersive out there and that's just a snippet of one of those. And if you look online, there's quite a lot um, extensive explanations what that term means so what is what is immersive technology well um this is an ever-growing list and um the list keeps growing because again i think um exasperated by these situations where we're in um, a global pandemic and um these virtual events immersive terms keep keep growing and growing but broadly speaking 
and we can think about these sort of things as uh, projection mapping. Um, virtual reality is probably one of the most obvious ones where you put a head, head mounted display on. And we have things like um, augmented reality. Um, if you're not familiar with augmented reality, these are kind of the Pokemon Go experiences, um, Snapchat filters, which we'll, we'll talk about later on as well. And these um, essentially augmented reality is adding a digital overlay to the, the real world environment, whereas a virtual reality is kind of locking you off inside a headset. And then we kind of got a mix between the two there, which, which is mixed reality, which is kind of somewhere in the middle of that space. Um, so it's the Microsoft HoloLens devices or um, the Magic Leap um, devices that um, are kind of projecting that digital world in front of you using these um, glasses when we're still waiting for these magical augmented reality glasses uh, to bridge that gap between augmented reality and mixed reality. Um, but it's a never ending story, it seems. Excuse me. And um, one of the other immersive technologies, I would argue, is um, 360 film. Um, a lot of um, VR developers um, will sometimes um, say that 360 film doesn't represent um, virtual reality, but I'll, I'll touch on why that isn't the case um, later on during this presentation. Yeah, but it's not just limited to that technology, those technologies as well. It's quite a lot of other technologies that we can think of being immersive. Uh, immersive theater was, um, it's been around for, I don't know, 10, 20 years, probably longer. It's just that we've started using technology in immersive theater to create these experiences. Um, however, it's took a real um, kick in the bucket um, with the pandemic and um, that business model is kind of really struggling. I've been working with clients recently where I've been capturing uh, theater productions, which has been really interesting. It's just that um, those audience participation, um, immersive experiences like the great um, Gatsby and, and things like that, they've sort of struggled recently because you can't get everyone in a room without catching COVID, unfortunately. Um, but we've also got um, interactive web experiences. This is something I'll, I'll demonstrate a project to you later on as well, or WebXR. It's where you go on to um, an interactive um, web portal and you, you interactive interact with those spaces. I think you could um, constitute um, maybe something like Fortnite, Fortnite Online or um, these digital online festivals that you go to that are placing like uh, Glastonbury and things like that as that kind of thing. And then um, I, would, I would say that immersive can also be um, telepresence as well, which is kind of um, Zoom, um, social VR experiences. But um, I, I think there's a bit of debate on, on that, um, but we'll come on to that in a moment. And just thinking about um, immersive art itself. So this is a still picture taken from a company called Team Lab. And they're a, a Japanese uh, immersive arts organization and they create these exhibitions. So that's a, a still photograph of this um, immersive um, exhibition where you actually physically walk into the space. And that, that was a permanent exhibition. It's um, expanded to New York and then there was one in Holland as well. I'm not sure how they're getting on with this um, global issue as well. I, I would imagine that their numbers have been dwindling. Uh, but thinking about the immersive art and what that is to be able to step into that space and we're actually physically interacting with those projections you're walking on usually what would be a reflective surface and um, that's got a projection on and that's kind of what you're seeing in this image um, but it can relate to other technologies as well when we when we think about immersive it doesn't necessarily have to be um, a, a headset um, or projection mapping it can can be a piece of audio then there's other people who would argue what what is immersive in terms of uh, immersive art like just a book if you read a book you can be immersed and that's like the ultimate immersive art because it's um, using your imagination so there's quite a broad set of terms really and it's never growing list um, but i want to try and focus your attention on some virtual reality here so when we think about um, virtual reality and we think about the term terminology where they actually comes from and um, there's some um, famous people um, in recent history and um, this chap Jaron Lanier, uh, or Lanier coined the term in around 1987 and he used it to describe the experience made possible by the use of latest generation of goggles gloves and related um, technologies so these are kind of the haptic devices that are wearable as well but um, he's 
probably one of the few arguably uh, people in this space that haven't hasn't allegedly been funded by the military um, industrial complex because what you'll actually find is that a lot of these new technologies have their origins in um, the tech and arms um, industries so for example the head mounted display for virtual reality um, was developed for fighter pilots so they could uh, blow people up um, it's a little bit sad but that's that's unfortunately where the money is and that's the world we live in um, so a lot of technology is funded um, by weapons manufacturers and things like this. I'm not saying all of them are, but um, certainly there are quite a few. And then there's uh, this uh, French uh, philosopher, media theorist called Pierre Levy, and he was uh, speculating about what, what VR was. It was too important, too wondrous, too powerful to permit continued disciplinary ignorance. So when, when these kind of people start theorizing what vi virtual reality is and you start coining these terms, then, then it becomes more mainstream. And we've been waiting for, I guess, virtual reality to become uh, more adopted uh, for quite some time now. And actually, believe it or not, this is actually the third wave of virtual reality. This, this technology um, is new and it's in its infancy, but this is actually the third generation of virtual reality. If you're interested in some um, cool um, films in regards to virtual reality, then I would say watch Lawnmower Man. You might think it's a terrible film, but it's a really interesting um, example of like where we could potentially be going. And um, yeah, it's kind of interesting. Um, one of the books that I um, swear by, and I, I, I think is really interesting and kind of sparked my imagination with this kind of stuff is um, this book called Virtual Art from Illusion to Immersion. Um, and the author traces back the history of the image to the present day, examining how immersive techniques have been used by the ancients to continue um, to impact on the aesthetics of new media, um, tracing that lineage uh, through to present day virtual reality technology. And an example that stands out for me in this book is the Rotunda. And these were um, the kind of immersive low tech spaces so you could actually physically walk inside a painting and these were norm normally huge um, semi-circular canvases that you would physically walk into a painting and feel like you, you were immersed and there's um, several other examples of, of these um, types of technologies um, throughout this book so if you're interested in finding out a little bit of the history and um, where this art form comes from its origins and these ideas of, of immersion comes from that would uh, put you in the direction of that book is an excellent read why should we care though um well that's a good question um, <laughs> um we might end up with a a world like this if um google glass or apple had their way then we might end up in a, in a crazy um, dystopian world. I'm just going to play one or one or two minutes of this just to give you an idea of um, where we could end up going. Oh, there's no sound. No sound, oh, okay. yeah. That's interesting. So uh, I think Maya just said there's no sound. Oh, sorry about that, guys. Uh, that's really annoying, that, isn't it? I don't know why it's doing that. I tested this out before and there was sound playing. Um, no, not sure why. Um, you're going to have to just stick with my voice and maybe share the link from Vimeo. Yeah, I've got... Um, I've got the links here. Actually, that's a good shout. Um, I can do that immediately, can't I? Um, one second. Here's a video now. I'm just going to pop that into the chat for you. Um, sorry about that, guys. Um, there's a little bit. All right, someone's saying there's a little bit of sound. That's that's kind of the maximum I, could, I think I could go to um, on that. I could try a little bit louder, but I don't want to you know, overwhelm your senses with that. But essentially... Um, it's a really interesting um, 
piece of work because what it's essentially doing is um, having a look or speculating how society could um, go if we really adopted augmented reality. Um, yeah, it kind of goes a bit a bit crazy with these kind of dog things. I mean, do we really need augmented reality to go to a supermarket? I'm not sure about that. Um, but yeah, um, that's that. I'll just go back to the presentation. So yeah, check that out. Um, I'll provide all the links as well um, in post um, after this presentation. So you can actually have a look at that um, yourself. But the, the piece is called Hyper Reality. I'm just going to check. Can everyone hear me all right still? No issues on the audio. I'm not getting a response to that yet. Yep. All right. Brilliant. Audio is great. Thank you very much. Um, okay. So what can immersive technology achieve that traditional methods or other art forms cannot? So this is when it gets really interesting. And this is what I think about when I'm, when I'm actually making work or I'm actually um, exploring other people's work. I start thinking about um, what are the strong things of the medium? What can the medium allow me to do that um, other art forms that I would argue cannot do so well? Um, so the first one of those is simulation, the use of computer technology to create artificial, visual, auditory and tactile worlds. What does that mean? Well, essentially, um, going back to the definition earlier, and um, we're thinking about being immersed in, in that space with um, uh, 3D, CGI, and stuff like that. So you, although you can be close to a, a, a monitor or a screen, it's not quite the same as being locked off. So if you haven't used much VR yet, then um, which will come on to in a moment, some headsets you can get pretty cheap, then I would um, advise you to, to um, start playing around with a little bit of the technology just, just to explore what you can actually use. Um, again, that's tying into the, the sense of immersion, this, this vividness, this feeling of uh, being inside this artificial uh, visual auditory world and then once we start adding interaction into the, this space or the world that's when we get a really interesting uh, feedback mechanism and um, we know that mobile phones work so well it's because we we're getting a dopamine release because it's targeting two areas of your brain your top down bottom up um, cortical response i think it is and that is uh, giving you a stimulation and a release of dopamine. So when we start putting those kind of things in a virtual reality world, it enhances the experience even further. So if you look at what Oculus Quest have developed now, they've developed this hand tracking tool, so you don't actually need to use the controllers anymore, which is really interesting. And for me, though, the most important thing about good VR, what, what makes it um, such an interesting art form or immersive technology rather, it's not just VR, um, is embodiment. Um, the ability to experience um, somebody else's perspective and not just your own. And it's um, really the idea of um, feeling empathy for a situation that a character is facing. Um, and it's convincing our senses that we're either that person or we're actually in another space. And it's particularly powerful um, in, in virtual reality, in a headset. Um, and you can achieve this with 360 film. And it doesn't have to be um, the most expensive, expensive thing that you create. You can actually achieve some amazing things, which will come on in a moment, too, um, just with a, a cheap bit of kit, really. Uh, OK. Oh, yeah, there's a, I want to mention that there's an, an interesting experience as well. And uh, for those that do have um, virtual reality headsets called Traveling Wild Black. Um, it's part was part of the Tribeca Film Festival that was re released during the pandemic. So if you're interested in something that um, gives you give you this uh, emotional empathy machine, it's, uh, it's a really interesting one to try. Thinking about tel telepresence, um, I mean, is this is this telepresence now? Um, the rise of virtual events it's somewhat of a cliche we're having these these conversations on, on technology that's existed for what 20 years webcams uh, but it's interesting to start thinking about um, how we can actually enter other spaces um, through technology and virtual reality technology um, to actually feel like we're we're actually beamed into another space so this idea of remote viewing um, I think that's where the technology could potentially take us um, when we're going to get out of our own little bubble on planet Earth and stuff like that, potentially. We'll have to wait and see if uh, Elon Musk develops something like that. If he had, if he had his way, he'd um, give us all a brain chip, wouldn't he? We'd all have that augmented reality nightmare that we seen a moment ago. Um, there you go. Um, so some ideas on what telepresence is in, in popular media and um, experiences. So here we've got um, alt space VR. So that's a social 
um, space where you can actually go interact with other characters and you can actually um, explore the space and you can go to events together. You can create your own avatars. Um, in popular media, uh, the film in the top right, and uh, that's a film called Surrogate. So if you're interested in exploring um, film that's looking at these ideas of um, remote viewing and telepresence, that's a really interesting one. Um, I won't give away too much of the film, but it's uh, basically Bruce Willis and other characters. A uh, little clue is that they look a little bit robotic there. I don't want to give spoil the film too much for you, but it's it's really interesting one. And then bottom left again, looking at the the web webinar thing. Um, are we actually using telepresence in, in that space? I would say not so much yet, but the way it's going and with this 3D capture technology, we will be. And then um, a similar one to the alt space is VR chat, where you can actually go meet characters, hang out with your friends and actually go to comedy shows and things like that together. So that's really interesting. I just want to check um, that you can still hear me. I'm just going to go back on the chat. Uh, yes, there's some interesting conversations there uh, um, happening. So yes, you can still hear the the actual audio. That's great. Moving on. So taking control and new ways of experiencing. This is um, an experience that um, I kind of um, looked at a long time ago when I was first studying um, these virtual reality um, experiences and looking at what they could do. And this is a really interesting example of um, using cgi or computer generated imagery and um, to actually be immersed in a space and it's called square pusher store eagles now obviously we've got no audio so i'll just i'll show you um a little bit of a screenshot of that um i wanted to play it but it's, it's unfortunate oh i'll turn it down a little bit um so this is kind of, you presented this uh, CGI world. And again, if you've got a headset, try it out. This is a free experience. Um, you can go on, I think it's on the Within Engine on Oculus devices. You can download the Within app and then you can download this experience for free. It's also on YouTube as well. But what, what I think is really interesting about the design of this experience, and I mean, it's just, it might not look great now because you're seeing it on a 2D screen, which is why you should try it in VR is the fact that um, when you're traveling through this landscape, what happens is that um, these characters start waving to you and just something simple and subtle like that um, can, can make you like smile or feel like you're part of this experience. And it's a really interesting thing that they're actually doing because these characters are coming over to you and they're handing you things. I mean, it does, I don't want to spoil it too much, but it does go quite dark. Uh, after that, but um, it's a really interesting experience. I would uh, Keith, advise you. Keith, Hello? can I just interrupt? Um, sure. Mark Ashmore suggests if you maybe unplugged your headphones, the sound would play. Um, yeah, the problem with that, let me just try it. I think it'll just play through my speakers, though. Can you hear me now, Jenny? No, she can't. No. Yeah, yes, I, yes, I can hear you. Yeah. Okay, you can. I'm getting. You might get echo or feedback though through my speakers. Um, I'll try it. Is that any better? Because you, you're going to get the echo through my microphone then. It, it sounds okay to me. And what about other people? What are they saying? Sounds good. All right. Okay. Brilliant. Maybe that's the solution. Thank you, Project Charisma. Yeah, so, um, well, that's a lesson learned, isn't it? So I'm not going to play that all anyway, even though you might want me to sit there and uh, play it for you. <laughs> but uh, yeah, try that one out. It's really interesting. Another really interesting one, and I think this is even more powerful, and this is one I always go to, is a walk through dementia, and that's um, very powerful. Um, because this is using 360 film to make an experience and it gives you a really strong emotional connection to the participant or the person that you're embodying. I'm going to play that and I'm glad we've got sound back actually because that's great timing. Um, Hello, we'll be able to see. I'll play one minute. Oh, okay, yes, that would be nice. Hello. It's always a this is just about the front ramifications of that. Yeah. But at what point? Oh, I can get on. Right. And 
Is that going to be difficult? Or? Sure, there's the garden with the white flowers. Red flowers. Beautiful. Oh, there's that orange car. It's always parked there. Horrible colour. I can take this cut through back home. You don't want to go down there. Hang on. Hang on. This isn't the right cut through. This isn't the alleyway. Where does this go? This isn't right. <laughs> Joe. Joe. Where is Joe? Oh, that's Joe. Oh. Is it? I'm going to stop it there. So. I think for me, the reason why that works so well is because the team that who met that uh, made that experience, and um, we're looking at some of the um, symptoms or some of the issues that people encounter um, who have um, dementia. And if you know anyone who's um, got dementia or have you experienced it yourself, you'll you'll understand and recognise um, those, those issues. So I think for me, it works particularly well. And that's just using a 360 camera, and and they just thought about um, how they can actually make the experience a good experience. So they, they've used compelling storytelling in, in that experience. So people might disagree, subjective, obviously, but check it out. And uh, looking at some of the audio visual tools to create immersive experiences. And um, so for those people who have attended and are interested in actually creating their own experiences, this fits for you really. Um, but we can essentially um, make our own virtual reality experiences um, using what is now pretty cheap um, and easy to use technology. Um, I'll also add that every attendee today is going to receive um, 360 videos they can edit. They're going to receive a guide on how to edit the 360 videos. And I'm going to include some um, terminology glossary page as well about virtual reality. So that'll be sent straight after this um, sessions ended and you receive that so you can actually use um, some of the tips that I've given you today and actually make some stuff yourself. Um, but essentially, if you're interested in making your own experiences, then try out the Samsung Gear cameras. They're really cheap now and they're a few years old and they, they're like a really entry level um, sort of way of, of making 360 film. These are kind of the um, entry level, uh, the Kodak Pix Pro, and then you've got sort of the mid range, the uh, mid range GoPro Max is a new one that sounds really interesting. I've not used yet. The Fusion's really good, and I use the Insta 361 quite a lot. And then some of the, the I mean, this this list goes on and on and on. There's so many 360 cameras now, but some of the more expensive rigs um, include the GoPro Odyssey, uh, the Insta Pro, which is um, I, I use quite a lot of that one. It's a really nice camera to use. Um, the GoPro Odyssey is a bit overkill now. It's probably superseded, and this is an ever ever changing list. Um, if you're interested in audio production, um, a lot of people would say that um, audio is more than 50% of the experience, and I would tend to agree. Um, then the Zoom HR3 is a really interesting tool to use, but um, it's not necessarily the best tool to use. Um, you've got these other devices like the Sennheiser Ambio. That's a really expensive um, piece of kit. I'm not sure it represents the best value. I did find this Xyla one the other day, and that sounds like a, or looks rather, a really interesting piece of kit, and that allows you to record immersive music. So that, that's pretty cheap as well compared to the other ones. Uh, but if you're interested um, in a, a really sort of uh, interesting tool to use, then the Zoom HR3 is probably the best one of that, that list, I would say. But um, you can record your audio um, you have to be clever about the way you record your audio if you're making a 360 film, of course, which we'll come on to in a moment. Um, you can use plugins in Unity to create 360 sound effects. It's um, called um, audio uh, ambisonic sound in um, Unity, and that allows you to create 360 um, experiences and immerse your audience even further. And that's uh, probably a little bit out of the presentation today, this, this kind of technology um, games engine stuff. If, if you're really serious and you want to get deep into this stuff, that's kind of where you want to go with uh, immersive production, um, Unity, maybe Unreal. Some of the headsets you can use, these are the entry ones, are Google Daydream, Google Cardboard. 
The daydream's kind of obsolete now. You can still get them, but but essentially it's doing the same thing as a cardboard. What you can do is you can slot um, your mobile telephone in the back of the Google Cardboard, and then you can actually watch an experience. Um, just need to check that um, the phone fits that you're using. Um, usually um, the iPhone 4, 5, or something like that, they fit into the Google Cardboard. Um, it could, Oculus Go is a really interesting device. Unfortunately, what Oculus have decided to do is to make that obsolete by the end of this year. That means you can still use it, just that you won't be able to access the marketplace after, I think it's January this year. Likewise, the Oculus Rift is now obsolete because what's happening is the Quest 2 is coming into the market. So that's kind of uh, the latest device that's out later on this month. So you can pre-order that. It's about £299. Um, and a really expensive piece of kit is this Valve Index, which seems to me a little bit overkill. Some people um, swear by it. It's a really high-end um, virtual reality um, but then when you get Oculus Quest coming into the, the scene, it's kind of making that arguably obsolete a little bit. And then this other device is the Microsoft HoloLens, and that is a mixed reality device. And I think the number two HoloLens is out now. Looking at some of the workflows, um, practical 360 production. So if you're interested in this technology and you want to make something yourself, um, my advice is to learn how to play hide and seek, but safely. Um, so uh, trees, hills are your friends. The great thing about most of these cameras is that they have a native app that connects to your phone. It's usually via Bluetooth, and you can actually physically see within so many meters of actually what you're shooting. So um, getting, getting something like the Samsung Gear camera, for example, that has a native app that you can install on your phone on the Play Store or the iOS Store, and then you can actually physically see what you're actually shooting. So that's a really great way of being able to investigate um, a space and think about 360 cinematography. And I will say, though, if, if you're interested in making your own experiences, um, the interesting thing about 360 film is that you cannot be around that camera at all. So you can't put a boom, boom stick into the space. So if you had an audio uh, engineer, then you wouldn't be able to do that. Likewise, you wouldn't be able to put any artificial lights in the space because they would show in the camera. So you need to start thinking about those things. And then um, you can edit in certain fashions for 360 film as well. I'll come on to that in a moment. And sharing your experiences online is quite straightforward. And you can just go on YouTube and upload. Um, it'll detect that it's a 360 film automatically if you edit in Premiere Pro which brings us nicely onto this section. So in the pack that you're gonna to receive today, after this session, you'll get a guide on how to edit in Premiere Pro. And um, essentially all you need to do is once you've shot your 360 film and you've stitched it in the native, camera, uh, native app that you've used, is bring it into Premiere Pro. And then what you do is under the effects tab, type in VR or effects, and you'll get a list of different effects that you can use. Um, these allow, um, sort of uh, in-camera effects, they allow transitions, they flatten images and this kind of stuff, and they allow you to see where the, the perspective is in a 360 space as well. So it's a really interesting um, set of tools. It was actually created by a company called Metal that was bought out by Premiere Pro approximately two years ago, I think now. And so why would you do that? Well, um, you, using the tools that um, you're going to be given today, and um, you can go out and start making your own um, virtual tours. You can actually make your own experiences. Um, obviously, um, if you wanted to add a, an extra level of complexity, you'd need to understand coding to add hotspots and trigger points and things like that. There are native apps that are promised to do this for you, um, but I, I would say try and learn a bit of the coding if you're interested in taking it to the next level. Um, but you can create things like, I'll just go to this right okay so i'm going to jump to the section where they're on the canal i think is about here somewhere these huge letters of i amsterdam are a popular spot for taking pictures behind these letters you can see the rijksmuseum it's the biggest and most important museum of the netherlands it has over 8,000 displayed objects, and some of the highlights are Rembrandt's Nightwatch and Vermeer's Milkmaid. The museum is located on museum... That's something you have to watch out for, actually. <clears throat> See that shadow there? Um, 
I mean, you, you're not going to notice that so much now because we're looking for it, but in a, in a headset, you might notice that. So that could break the, immer the level of immersion when you've got a headset on. So bright, really bright, um, sunlight, low sunlight is not good for you using 360 film. Ideally, you want some sort of um, cloudy environment but um, the great thing about 360 film is that 18th century and they've played an important role in defense transport and water control of the city and to experience amsterdam from the water is truly amazing because all along the connect and now you can do it online so yeah you can actually um, go to amsterdam without actually visiting there which is really interesting so this technology um, if you think about it during a pandemic We've not actually been able to physically go to a lot of places, but using immersive technology, we can sort of circumvent this and actually use these tools and experiences to take audiences outside of physical space. And um, just, just on the title of this um, webinar, really, we were talking about um, immersive, um, taking audiences to spaces and particularly vulnerable people. So that's interesting because um, people who can't actually, um, who are not able-bodied, for example, can't actually Get out their own home and they can use this technology um, there's a, usually an annual um, vr competition by a company called loros who do um, do dementia work and this kind of thing and they they look for people to create immersive experiences so when you see someone who's not able-bodied to um, get out themselves and they experience something like this i think it's really rewarding I was going to cover 360 editing in Blender, maybe on a later session, but I'm just mentioning it now because it's another tool that you can use to edit 360 film, and it's a free tool, so it won't cost you anything. There's a bit of a learning curve to get your head around it. Uh, Blender is essentially a 3D um, creation tool. It allows you to create 3D models. It allows you to do um, editing video. There's a whole host of um, crazy things that allow you to do, VFX and this kind of stuff. And it's a really interesting tool for those people looking to get into the immersive sector and understand um, what you can actually create. And it's also integration with games engines such as Unity and Unreal. And the game, game engine stuff, by the way, that's kind of like um, creating CGI environments and doing some really advanced stuff. I think we touched on that uh, a moment ago in the, in the tools section. Okay, so we have... Um, a poll. <laughs> we have a, a poll question here. Um, so for the rest of this event, uh, what animal would you like me to become? So I'm going to, I'm going to create the poll now and just bear me a second while I flick back off the share in the screen. And then I'm going to ask you the poll. So if I go to launch poll, right. So can everyone see that poll? Let me get some feet. Oh, we've got some boats. Oh, oh, here we go. Yes. <laughs> so I'm going to give you probably about three seconds, five seconds more, and just to see um, what the results are. Okay, so that'll do. So end poll. Oh, people would like to see me um, as a hamster for the rest of this session. Well, let's have a look what we can do here. <laughs> Someone said badger. <laughs> uh, There's a private joke there. That's a very good one, Garrett. We'll, we'll talk about that another time. <laughs> um, so let's just go back to the presentation. One second. Uh, oh, look, there we go. So I'm actually a dog <laughs> instead. So unfortunately, I don't have um, the badger or the hamster in my arsenal today. Um, but the reason why I've, I've done it in this way is because um, I want to introduce you to um, these um, other tools that you can use, uh, augmented reality filters. So using, um, I could have done it today. I had the video set up and stuff like that, but it was quite, quite heavy on my graphics card and didn't want to um, kind of push it over the edge and collapse the virtual presentation. So I've not actually done that. But using Snapchat filters, we can create our own um, virtual filters. And this is what we were talking about earlier on with the augmented reality. Um, we can create, um, we can actually make our own creations as well. Um, you can actually, if you're good at graphic design or drawing, you can actually make these filters and share them with the world. I think you can, I think most of them are free, you can charge for them as well. So I'm looking to potentially cover the augmented um, reality tools kit and uh, maybe touch on some of this um, Snap, Snapchat stuff at a later date. Um, but this is it essentially, um, if you go to lensstudio.com, um, snapchat.com so that's lensstudio.snapchat.com 
you can actually start experimenting um, with these filters. And it's a free, free piece of software, so you just download it, and then it integrates with your webcam, and you can start um, having, adding these filters onto your, your web experiences if you want to. Um, or you can do things like the video. Um, this is kind of a sector that's, that's growing more and more as well, this um, overlay of, of CGI and stuff. I'm not going to go into that too much today, um, but yes, interesting one to try out. Um, just looking at the design approach for creating immersive experiences, um, one of the, uh, or two of the methods rather, uh, for doing that um, are these, which is um, a games design document um, and a book um, or a sprint methodology. And um, the sprint methodology was um, created by a, a guy called Jason Knapp, who used to work for Google. And it's a really interesting one if you're looking at um, working together as project teams to create a piece of work. And it doesn't necessarily have to be immersive technology that you're outputting. It could be a game, it could be a film even. It's a really interesting methodology um, that they adopted in Google to try and um, create rapid prototyping. Um, and it's one that um, a colleague and friend of mine, Mark, who I think is on the, the chat today, um, as used before um, during VR labs, where um, we're doing these rapid prototyping of experiences and actually creating a, a piece of work over a short period of time with the, with a team of people. So I recommend that book because it's really interesting. Um, but the the game design document that's really interesting to look at that as well. And um, this is used um, for creating games, but it's an interesting methodology that can be used for creating pretty much anything. Um, part of the information pack as well. What I'm going to include is access to a film that you can download called Resurgence. Um, that was a really interesting project that I worked with Jenny, who's in the, in the chat, who's answering the questions today, in conjunction with the Carbon Landscape and Lancashire uh, Wildlife Trust. And um, the Carbon Landscape is, um, I think it's 14 part partners, Jenny can correct me if I'm wrong, including uh, the Mersey Rivers Trust, Wigan Council, Salford City Council. Lancashire, uh, Manchester and North, Merseyside Wildlife Trust, amongst others. Um, and what we were able to do is create this uh, poetic, immersive experience using space, um, this idea of telepresence and actually go into a different space and experiencing nature in a, in a different way. And so if you're interested in, in that, um, you'll get a link after this session to download that experience. And if you've got a headset as well, there's a set of instructions with that experience on how to sideload it. Just to see if there's any chat questions in regards to that. Okay, yeah, Mark's mentioned he's, he's plugging his lab, lab there. That's fine. Um, okay. So just looking at some of the other experiences that I've made as well. Um, this was an interesting project called the Degree Show Mars, um, whereby uh, I was approached by a university to create an online um, experience for grad students. So the, the pandemic happened. Um, and I was in touch with these people at um, the university and they asked me to create an experience where they um, fine art students could still have a degree show. I wouldn't actually um, wouldn't would enable the members of the public to visit the show. So it's a really interesting way of um, integrating uh, 3D assets and um, models and this kind of stuff. I'll show you a, a snippet of that. So you can, you can access the page by going to degreeshowmars.com. Essentially, you give them the option of launching the experience. Um, we created this um, video CGI experience, and the client didn't ask for any sound on this particular um, entrance sequence, if you like. But then we, we come into the um, experience. We're landing what is Gale Crater on Mars, because, you know, doing a bit of research about Mars. Um, and then we're actually inside the, the Gale Crater. And then what we're presented with here is a number of objects that students have chosen that represents their work. Um, so, for example, um, I've got this kind of rock device here. Uh, I've got from Rachel, if click on her um, item. It takes us down a wormhole. I'm not sure how well the video is playing back, sharing the screen. Um, but then what, what happens is we end up um, going to Liverpool John Moores University. And, and actually, uh, we're actually immersed in this space. You can actually enter it as VR if you want to. But what this allows us to do is showcase the student work uh, remotely. So we've got all these hotspots in the space. We can navigate and travel around the space and using the uh, 3D scans, um, uh, using the technology called Matterport 3D scanning. And we're actually able to um, scan, the, scan the space uh, for a later date. And this is what we did. 
and so we could transport the viewer into another space. So I would argue that's a really um, interesting example of um, being um, uh, beaming us into another space, probably the, the telepresence um, example that we were thinking about. There's another experience there as well. Um, I think one or two might, might be familiar with that. It's the Mill Girls and Militants um, experience. That was an immersive dance experience um, that we were commissioned to do. There's a link um, to that as well. And then some of the other projects that I've been working on recently, I've been, um, for the company, I've been working on training simulators for next generation health services and um, immersive experiences for fashion companies. Um, I've been working on international heritage projects. So this is a still from um, when I went to, in the bottom right is when I went to Ireland, I think last year. Um, some of the other uh, fashion brands I've been working with as well. Theatre, I've been working with theatre companies at the moment to create immersive experiences. I think um, there's a few theatre companies that are frightened at the moment that um, might have a second lockdown, which is looking increasingly likely by the day, a hard lockdown maybe. Um, so yeah, so this is the kind of sector sectors that I've gone down with the company and this is the work we're doing at the moment and just thinking about the way the the industry is kind of changing um, I'm trying to really focus your attention on uh, production really and um, some of you may be familiar with um, the Unreal Engine which was mentioned earlier um, but there's some new techniques now um, whereby filmmakers can go into a space and actually create uh, experiences not actually physically needing to go to um, a location, a set location. It's very interesting because what that does, it, it saves on cost of traveling to the location. It saves taking the crew to a location. And also it, in this example, using the studio environment, uh, we're not actually at risk of um, you know, encountering COVID-19 in the real world. We can actually stay in our little space. Not that one, one second. Oh. Play you one more of this. Part of what's been fun about collaborating on The Mandalorian with Lucasfilm and Disney is that we have been able to see through a few technical innovations and a few firsts that I think are going to have a lot of impact on the way uh, television and movies are made moving forward. In partnership with ILM and Epic, we have put together a system whereby which we can have game engine, real-time render and video wall technology coming together to create a backdrop for the big, beautiful world of Star Wars. The volume is 21 feet tall. It's 75 feet in diameter, run by seven machines, pumping the visuals onto the screen that's, that's been created in pre-production and can be on the screen within 24 hours of, of being final. It's incredibly impressive when you first walk out there because it completely surrounds your peripheral vision. And you really quickly forget that you're indoors and you're not out on some planet's surface. It feels like a real three-dimensional environment surrounding you because it is a three-dimensional environment. You can allow your key creatives to all make decisions together so that the shots are captured entirely in camera, which allows for a better performance. And what was so exciting about this is by bringing those people together, things started to click and we started to realize, well, let's not just do green screen interactive light. If we're going to design the whole set and game it ahead of time, maybe we could have some in-camera effects. Everything in the volume is designed to both light the actors and to be a background that we can directly photograph. So you end up with real time final pixels in camera. If you look at visual effects, so um, that's really interesting um, workflow for creating experiences in a studio environment. Obviously, they've got quite a bit of um, a budget in their, their arsenal there. But um, with, a, with a simple green screen using Unreal Engine, which is free, you can actually create your, your own um, experiences. Um, you don't need a massive studio. Um, but what they're talking about there really is the, the ability to... Um, create um, whatever landscape they want using this capture technique and not actually physically go to the space. So it's saving a lot of money and time. So I think that's the future really. And if you have a look into that kind of stuff, there's, there's so much going on. Um, if you look into uh, virtual production in Unreal Engine, just search for that, so much going on. 
Another technique uh, is quite advanced is uh, volumetric filmmaking. Um, this is essentially making your own holograms. It's existed for a few years now, this technique, but it's, it's still relevant. You, you might be familiar with this kind of uh, pattern mesh. Um, it became a trope about three years ago, five years ago, and you could see quite a few music videos using this um, technique. And um, there's quite a few interesting examples. Um, Zero Days VR, um, for example, is an interesting uh, one. Um, that you can actually uh, um, go on and, and find online. Um, that is on the, I'm not going to play that now, um, but essentially uh, there's a web link um, to the experience here. I'll put that in the chat, actually. Um, but um, you can actually experience that in VR as well and understand, get a feel of the techniques that they used. So if you're interested in that, go and check it out. I'm just conscious of time as well. I think I'm running slightly behind. There might be people who need to um, leave. But I'm going to stick, stick around for some questions anyway. If you're interested in finding out about the immersive economy and how things are shaping up, the last report in 2019 is online, the Immersive Economy Report. Um, it's run by Innovate UK. And there's a link there um, to the actual um, organization, if you like. They do a number of, of different things. If you, um, if you want to get funding for something, and uh, try, try looking into Creative XR as well. They do a lot of funding for experiences. Okay, so speculating the future and where, where might be, we may be heading rather. Um, so some of the most popular experiences include things like Bandersnatch. If you're not familiar or you've not um, tried that one out, it's on Netflix. It's a really interesting example of audience participation. I think that's where we're going with a lot of this immersive technology. We're actually entering an era of more and more in interact interaction with the audience uh, because we've become really saturated. I think Netflix hasn't helped us in that respect because there's so much content now. I per on a personal level, I, I just can't do all that kind of stuff. There's so much. I just spend half an hour um, sitting there looking what to actually watch. I don't end up watching anything these days. Um, but an interesting experience is Bandersnatch because it's um, it's kind of like choose your own adventure. It's the um, it's the illusion of choice actually. If you look into it, it's really interesting. Um, choose your own adventure experience. And then more recently, um, Jude Law um, starred in a, in, a, in a drama that is actually on Sky at the moment called The Third Day. And the idea around that was that um, it was um, a live streaming event and uh, the audience could um, interact with the, the cast and take them down different paths as well. So if you're interested in that kind of stuff and where, where that's going, check those out. Um, online events. So I attended um, Lost Horizon event, um, which was during the pandemic when we couldn't leave our own homes. That was really interesting um, because you could go there in virtual reality. Um, likewise, um, on the bottom left, this um, statue of a lady, that's the Burning Man VR Festival. So that's the first time that they decided to switch to an online platform because of the pandemic. And then we've got um, Travis Scott's live performance in Fortnite. I think that broke a lot of records for the number of participants that were involved. That was something like a few million. It was like the biggest ever festival because it was actually showcased in Fortnite. That's a really interesting thing that's happening with the technological trend as well, is that um, the next generation is actually going onto these platforms and experiencing gigs and comedy shows and things like this. Um, and then the virtual factory as well, the image just to the left. That's a really interesting thing that um, Manchester International Festival done recently as well. And to allow you to, to visit the virtual factory. I mean, the virtual word is going to carry on being a buzzword for, for a while. And we've got, oh, yeah, the um, horizons by Facebook and the little image where the guys are waving to you at the bottom. Um, that's um, an interesting space, social VR space that's emerging at the moment. Some people have access to it. Um, I'm just thinking about the, the the future and some of my reading and um, some of the things I've, I've discovered. There's a really interesting futurist uh, called Jane McGonigal. She's uh, got a fascinating mind and she looks at the, the future through the lens of um, games design and, and being a, an avid gamer herself. She wrote a really interesting book called Reality is Broken. Um, and that's a fascinating approach to try and, trying to deal with real-world problems. 
and she wrote this book, I think it was in early 2000, um, and she was talking then about the, the coming pandemics that we were going to experience, the wave of pandemics that we were going to experience, and um, how we might deal with those things as a society. So it's really interesting um, foresight to be able to see these things coming. And it was um, her approach to actually how we can work together, creating this gamified um, approach to um, experience creation to, to deal with issues. And she did a, a TED talk as well called Gaming, Can We Make a Better World? That's really interesting as well. So if you're interested in, um, I guess, a female uh, futurist who's got some really interesting ideas on the way we can solve problems, then definitely check her out. Um, just some links to... Um, other works as well, um, things that you might be interested in. Um, I'll make the, the links uh, public as well um, so you can have access to the, the various links that we've talked about today. Um, so the books we've mentioned, uh, virtual art, and then um, some of the articles that you might want to look at. Uh, there is no cyberspace. There is only um, cyberspace if you have a Google of those. And then um, a couple of the groups that I've been involved with over the last few years, uh, Mercy of Arts by Future Artists. That's um, a group of um, creatives that come together um, that create um, a piece of uh, virtual reality normally over the long, long weekend. So that's been good to develop my own practice. And then because I'm, I'm uh, in the Manchester area, I can't not mention VR Manchester, of course, um, who um, usually uh, buy monthly meetup of um, um, creatives where we hang out and talk about virtual reality. It's not just creatives, it's anyone really. If people just want to actually experience virtual reality, come play a bit of VR, find out about what's going on in, in that um, space. And that's about it really. Um, if you're interested in uh, reaching out, or you've got any questions, or you, you have any comments, um, oh, my, my camera just died on me. Um, that's interesting. Can you still hear me? Yes, we can still hear okay, you. Okay, brilliant. Yeah. We can, we can I've, I've, I've been writing questions down. Do you want me to go through a few of them? Yeah, sure. So Jenny's just going to prompt me for the for the questions. Um, yeah, so, go ahead. So a question from Maya is, where do you learn coding? That's a very good question, Maya. Um, you can learn coding in a number of um, different um, places, but Free Code, Free Code Academy is one of them. Um, it's really um, interesting. Um, way of learning coding. Udemy.com has courses as well. So Free Code Academy, which is a free free online course, and um, Udemy.com is a really interesting um, way of, of learning um, other things as well. Um, Alan Hook, Ailing, and Mark Ashmore have sort of put things on the chat. Really, some some additional links, I guess, um, okay. for different things that you've mentioned as you've sort of spoken. Uh, gone through one of the questions from Bradley yeah. um, was have you seen an increase in business uh, during the COVID period um, yes so the answer to that Bradley um, Bradley's question have I seen an increase in business um, since the pandemic yes I have um, I've personally uh, I've worked through, through the entire pandemic so I've not actually stopped um, is, is the answer to that can Keep. Can you see Tracy Tinker? She's just written something there. Do you, do you want to answer uh, that? One? Okay, so Tracy Tinker. I've been shooting narrative pieces on a Fusion 360. It shoots 5K. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a very good question, Tracy. So um, shooting, it's all very well giving you 5K. How do you get onto um, a headset? So um, the answer is um, I, I would um, bring it down a notch in editing. So what you can do is on your on Premiere Pro, Tracy, if you have access to that, um, you can go into create a sequence with the video that you've shot at 5K and then export that out as uh, 3840 by 1920, which is essentially um, 4K. So I'll just write that in the chat for you. 3840 by 1920 equals 4K. Um, and that's the that's the actual um, there you go three eight four zero by nineteen twenty is the um, aspect ratio. Does that help, Tracy? Can you still hear me? Yeah, we we can still hear you. All right, Keith. okay, yeah. it's gone quiet then. <laughs> Any more questions from anyone? I mean, Keith, I was just going to say myself that I was just. Yeah going to share my own experience of working with you, Keith. Um, oh, brilliant. 
So, so Keith and I um, shot the uh, 360 film Resurgence, and we we perhaps did it a bit the wrong way round uh, because I worked with a, another filmmaker initially, and we did the audio first, and then did the film. So, you know, it, it was an interesting thing that we had to sort of make the two match, didn't we, Keith? But um, what was really interesting is just how atmospheric it is to be completely immersed in a green space. And you can sort of like study the micro detail or look up and feel the, the bigger the bigger feeling. So I think, you know, it's, it's a really, really promising way. And one of the things we've been very keen to do, which we haven't managed, was to take these sort of going into green spaces into dementia cafes, because we thought it'd be a space where very vulnerable people who can't go outside, usually through risk of falling, can sort of experience the sort of power of nature um, through through the headset. So yeah, we're, we're really keen to hopefully one day be able to do that, but obviously cannot do that at the moment. Um, yeah, so um, that's a really interesting point. So we wanted to put it in dementia cafes, didn't we? I think that was where you're looking to go into as well, wasn't it, Jenny? Um, you said. Yeah. There's a, can you see the comment from Joby? Yeah, Vimeo is limited to 4K 360 comment. They've not really moved with the frames and their HMD support isn't so good. Yeah, um, I've been using YouTube to upload content too and just making the link unlisted as well just to make, um, uh, just being able to share that link with um, maybe clients that are interested in actually having the link online as well. And um, so I think, I think I'm not entirely 100% sure, I'd have to look into that YouTube might um, support a higher um, resolution of content as well. And certainly when I've uploaded 360 content, it seems to play back a lot, lot smoother. Vimeo, I've had a few issues actually with um, uploading some of the content recently. So Kate, uh, oh no, uh, we're looking at this sort of thing in the travel sector as well uh, to connect people with places they can't go right now for entertainment but also well-being. Um, yeah, so um, just off the back of that, Kate, I think I think YouTube, have a look at their um, resolution as well. I think they do they do provide higher bit bit rate or higher sorry resolution for uploads as well. Um, just need to make sure that the video is unlisted and you can share the link and it won't be um, publicised anywhere unless, of course, you want to actually share that link um, with everyone, which you can do if you want to. Any more questions from anyone? No? I think that's about it. Then, Jenny, can you still hear me? Yeah, I, I can still hear you. Um one of the things we thought is if you wanted to give any feedback, you could send that to me personally. So not everybody else can see it, just me. Um, and that will help Keith sort of like if he does any future events, obviously that helps him as well. Um, so any feedback appreciated. But otherwise, yes, um, I think that's everything, Keith. Oh, here's another question, Tracy Senko. Where do you go for, uh, for artistic 360 film rather than uh, documentaries? Um, there's loads of different links. I would say, Tracy... Um, go to um, what's it called now? There's a I'll, I'll put it in the chat for you, Tracy. Um, within um, it's called Within Tracy. Um, that's a platform that has some really high quality um, artistic um, immersive experiences on, including a couple of the examples that we looked at a moment ago. Um, so if you go on an Oculus device, you need an Oculus device, I think, for that um, a headset. So if you go on and download the Within app inside the Oculus device, that's um, their platform. There's some there's some awful content they put on as well recently, but a lot of the archive stuff's really good, really high quality. There's, um, the video we looked at, Square Pusher Store, Eaglist was on there as well. Uh, the AR session. But just, um, just with, with Tracy's comment as well. Yeah. I mean, if, if somebody wanted a, an artistic film, you would be a really good person to go to because Keith has both sets of skills that he is artistic and has the technical skills, which is quite unusual to get in one person. So that's what, when I work with Keith, that's what I really, really enjoyed was that he got the artistry as well and really getting really nice shots was really, really important to him as well. Yeah, thanks for that, Jenny. I think... Um... Yeah, I'm happy to um, provide any, any advice as well that anyone needs. I think um, I think Tracy's uh, might have shot some stuff by the sounds of it as well herself. Um, so, um, yeah, just uh, anyone can reach out um, to me if they're looking to 
understand a little bit more about the technology, if they want other links and things like that, um, please please get in touch with me. I'm happy to provide any, any impartial advice or, or feedback that you want. Um, I'm also going to, um, straight after this session as well, provide all the uh, links that I promise. I know a lot of people, when you go to these webinars, say, oh, you're going to get the video. I never do. You never, you know, half the time you never do, but I'm actually, um, straight away, I'm going to give you the the documents um, that I've actually uh, put together because it's an important part of actually being able to take some of the tools away and make your own experiences as well. Um, I think um, some of the questions are a little bit technical I've been asking, um, but I'm happy to, to ask, answer those as well. Anyone else got any last questions before we, before we end it there? I think that's about it then, isn't it? Well, uh, I think um, that's it then. Thanks to everyone who's attended. Appreciate your time. Um, it's been great to um, do this first webinar. It's a bit of an interesting one. I practiced this several times, even though the camera was doing some weird stuff and then the audio was doing some weird stuff. Um, but there you go. Um, good luck with all your endeavours. Uh, oh, the AR session, Maya, I don't know yet. Um, I'm going um, I'm going to try and... Um, get my head around um, when to do that. I'll, I'll see if I can gauge the feedback because it was quite easy to um, advertise this as part of um, the um, Leeds Digital Festival. So I need to sort of advertise it. Um, so yeah, thanks, thanks everyone for for your kind comments. That's really good. Um, some more questions from Tracy. Yeah, um, some encoding questions there. Um, yes, I will. I'll do that. I'll um, I'll add you all to my uh, email list. Um, if anyone doesn't want want that, then please email me back and tell me you don't want to be part of that, and I'll I'll remove it. But I'll I'll, I'll make sure that I email um, everyone and add you to the next event that I'm going to do. And uh, like I say, um, please get in touch uh, via that um, email as well. All right. Well, thanks everyone. Um, good luck. Um, thanks for attending this event as part of Leeds Digital Festival. All the best.